Mini episode 446 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by Sportsology, delivering unconventional columns and webcasts about sports, TV, music, movies, and more. Follow them on the web at sportsology.info. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. This is FDH Lounge Managing Partner Rick Morris. We have with us today noted sports journalist Rick Buecher for many years covering the NBA beat for ESPN and ESPN Magazine, and a man who now spans a couple of different uh, large media companies. Uh, the station that he is at in San Francisco, 95.7 The Game, uh, is an ESPN radio affiliate, but additionally, uh, the man works for uh, the NBC Sports slash Comcast banner, as well as a little bit in uh, Turner Sports via the Bleacher Report. So at this point in time, uh, he is uh, being employed by a number of uh, major uh, media entities uh, who are all desirous of his uh, journalism and his uh, reportage, and it is a pleasure to be able to have him gracing our uh, independent brand here today. Great uh, pleasure to have him back on, as we had him on about a year or so ago to talk about some of these very same subjects, but it is a great pleasure to once again welcome to the FBH Lounge, Rick Buecher from the Bay Area. Rick, welcome to the program today, sir. You are sitting in uh, maybe the epicenter of the baseball world here. Quite a coincidence, uh, 25 years to the famous uh, Bay Area Earthquake World Series. Maybe yep. not as likely as it was looking 30 to 60 days ago, but uh, A's Giants again. What's the chatter out there uh, that we could be seeing a second Bay Area World Series? Well, it's certainly quieted down because of the struggle that the that the Giants are going through. There's a lot of expectation that uh, that the A's could get there. Although I think there's also, you know, there's, there's healthy – look, they won the division the last two years. They are in that same place. There's, there's, there's a reasonable question whether they are built to have great success during the regular season, but how uh, – just how fearsome can they be uh, in, in the postseason because they have lack of experience. Uh, you know, the, the – the, the postseason in for, for with baseball is just different. You're not playing every day. You have days off, so you can you can utilize your roster differently. The one thing that makes the A's so formidable right now is the fact that they have incredible depth. They platoon everybody. I mean, they have they've lost. Craig Gentry has a broken hand, and Coco Crisp has a neck issue, and they don't miss a beat offensively. I mean, what what other team could lose their first and second center fielders, especially two guys that are as dangerous? On the on the base paths that are that are their number one one A and one B leadoff guys, and continue to roll without any issue. So that's a reflection of their depth. Who's that bat in the middle? Of, who's the Cabrera? Who's the Dustin Pedroia? Who's that? Who's the big poppy? Who's the guy who has delivered with big hits in the postseason that you can count on? That you know that the uh, the opposition has to uh, account for, not only when he's up, but in anticipation of when he's coming up, all of that is still out. I mean, they have candidates, Josh Donaldson, Brandon Moss, the way, the way he's swinging the bat. Uh, but, but those guys have not demonstrated in the postseason. So, uh, you know, A's quietly, you know, there's, there is a, there is a hope uh, that this is the year that they go to the world series, but considering that they haven't been able to get past the Tigers the last two years, I think there's healthy, healthy caution with that. And for the giants, it's simply a matter of, can they get healthy in time? Um, because their with uh, their inability to score, because they were they were um, they were they weren't go as hot as the A's, but they were pretty darn close offensively at the beginning of the year. They, everybody was hitting home runs. It was very unlike the Giants uh, historically, especially playing in AT and T Park. But ever, Brandon Crawford was hitting home runs. Michael Morse was just <laughs> was jacking them at a, at a prodigious rate. I mean, they they were getting it. They were getting it from everywhere, uh, and uh, and then suddenly uh, Angel Pagan gets hurt, and we've seen over the last two years just how important he is to them, how thin they are when it comes to speed on the base paths 
and a leadoff guy because now you're looking at, at Hunter Pence, who I think he was batting sixth in Philadelphia. I mean, he's looked he's he's looked at as one of your power hitters. He, he's he's been forced into the position of of leading off and has done an admirable job, but it has really stalled uh, their offense. Brandon Belt broke his thumb, then then uh, a concussion. Matt Cain now is talking to James, uh, Dr. James uh, Andrews, and anytime anybody is going to see Dr. Andrews, that's never a good thing. So, um, you know, if healthy, I believe that their chemistry uh, gives them a fighting chance to still take the division from the Dodgers because as good as phenomenal as the Dodgers are, there's, they are an annoying team, and there's, I, I, there's just something, and we've heard rumblings of it, you know, the chemistry with that team. It, that, that team is a powder keg, always ready to implode. Uh, but if the Giants don't get healthy, I just I don't I, – I could see them missing the, uh, the playoffs entirely because uh, I like what the Cardinals uh, – the, the Cardinals to me are a dangerous team. I could see them as a wild card team. And I just – I think they're going to run out of if, – if they've got to fight for a wild card spot, I think they're in big trouble. I think they've almost got to win the division if they're going to have a chance of uh, uh, of making the postseason. That sounds about right. And uh, it, it's funny, when you were on last year, we were uh, kind of joking about this, the, the Giants being Team Saberhagen. So history's on their side. This is uh, an even-numbered year. And uh, yep. so that means, of course, they should go all the way. But what, what intrigues me about both of these uh, franchises here is uh, some of the commonalities. And I want to kind of get to that and, and what you think as far as how they've been assembled, because I have to tell you, the other day our FDH director of research, Nate Noy, just offhandedly referred to Oakland as a juggernaut at, at right now, and I can't argue with it, but you, you mentioned platooning. You mentioned some of the other things here that we do not tend to associate with that. They have so many guys on yeah. the team. The, the, the profiles that were out earlier this year underlined that. Donaldson, Moss, these are guys that any team could have had, and you know, really, the Giants lineup, you know, with with few exceptions, is kind of the same thing. The, the rotation has a little bit of a pedigree to it with guys like Baumgartner, Kane, although he's hurt right now. But when you look at the Giants lineup, when you look at the A's pretty much entire roster, you mentioned chemistry, but how much more is, is it than that as far as how these teams are assembled and, and, and how these parts that, again, you know, players that, that, you know, most of the other major league teams had a shot at at one point or another, how is it that they've been able to assemble these teams that are having this amount of success? Well, I, I, part of it, obviously, for the Giants has been pitching that great pitching staff. That's what they that's what they've invested in. That's what they put together. Uh, and then, you know, they've just been judicious in putting the other pieces together. But but chemistry, how guys operate in the clubhouse, and the reason that Hunter Pence got ninety million and why they, you know, he seemed like an odd fit, um, but. His personality was a perfect fit for their clubhouse. Um, they have a lot of guys. They don't have big egos. They don't have guys that, that uh, uh, aren't willing to sacrifice for the good of the team. And, uh, and, and that's why the Giants basically have kept their group together. Now, it is an odd, uh, it is an odd group because other than Buster Posey, there really aren't that many marquee names. Uh, on that team outside of their their pitching staff, uh, but that's you know that's part of the charm of AT and T Park is that it is a pitcher's park and uh, and that's really what they've they've based their success on uh, and they've done just enough to uh, they scored just enough runs to make it uh, effective. I, I really can't you know when you look at the Giants, I mean to me they're they're the oddest. World Series winning team uh, to do it twice in, in three years and neither time being sort of the dominant team or the favored team. And you look at it, and you look the way they did it coming back in 2012, you know, from, from elimination time after time. Uh, I remember taking my kids in 2010 to their first baseball game in August to a Giants game, and they were like, they lost to the Marlins. They were dead in the water. Uh, there was no atmosphere. And I thought, and my, I, I thought my kids will never be baseball fans because this sucks. And the next thing I know, they're – uh, they're catching the Padres and then making the World Series, and uh, are they beating Philadelphia? I mean, every round was an upset, and then uh, they catch Texas at the wrong time, and so they're a remarkable story. Uh, 
the A's are different. Their chemistry is phenomenal, but that's what not that's really not what Billy Bean looks at. Billy Bean looks at giving Bob Melvin every tool in the kit and then allowing him to manage, knowing that, okay, I have all these different arms. I have all these different type players. I have these different type outfielders, and I'm going to mix and match. And it's the secret to they don't have to pay anybody because nobody's a full-time player. So, you know, they've found guys, and, the, and, and, and some of it has just been, you know, finding great guys off the scrap heap or finding guys who – they saw something in uh, – Josh Donaldson, for example. Josh Donaldson was converted from a catcher. Sean Doolittle, was the, their closer, was converted from uh, – it was either first baseman or outfielder. Um, he was ready to quit baseball because he wasn't going to make it there. And he pitched a little bit in college and was sort of the last gas. They have all kinds of stories like that littered through it. Scott Tasmere, uh, you know, was, was in independent ball and uh, had some physical issues that threw his, uh, his entire motion out of, out of whack and, uh, and, and is a reclamation project, and now is back to being better than ever. I mean, he's found some tremendous diamonds in the rough, but a lot of it with, with the whole money ball thing isn't, isn't so much, you know, walks and milking the town and all of that stuff as much as it's it, – if there's a money ball factor to it, it is by platooning and by having guys at the right time in their career, you, they, don't, they don't have to pay them. And meanwhile, these guys are so hungry to prove that they can play in the major leagues, and Bob Melvin does a great job of communicating and keeping guys happy in spite of the fact that they don't know from day to day when they're going to play. Uh, it has made them a very effective, resilient bunch. You know, they play in a terrible – they play in the worst stadium – in the uh, uh, in, in the league, and yet they embrace it because it's like, yeah, you know, they're we're, they're 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 the pig pens, you know, they're the <laughs> we're the sad sack guys. We got nothing going for us. We're not getting paid. We play in a dump. I mean, it's a little bit like major league, you know. We're <laughs> we're the scruffy. We're we're the oddballs. We're the guys nobody wanted. And you know what? We're gonna prove to everybody that we can play great ball baseball in spite of it. That is what they are mining for their success, and so far it's worked. Well, you make a great point that the chemistry would not be an overt cornerstone that Billy Bean would be going for. I don't remember there being anything about chemistry with all the metrics of Moneyball yeah. there, but uh, you know it's it's funny too. You go back to that and and, and the movie that was made, and I understand that uh, the late great Philip Seymour Hoffman was, was said to have regretted that uh, his portrayal of Art Howe. Uh, didn't go yeah. so well for Art Howe's career, but uh, there was that friction, of course, with Billy Bean. And you talk about Bob Melvin now. Is there a certain amount, because I've heard a lot about what you said, about Billy Bean's reverence, really, for the job that he's done with them. Is there a little bit of Billy Bean at this point kind of unclenching the butt cheeks a little bit and saying, hey, look, I trust this guy. I'm giving him all these parts. I believe in him like I've believed in no other manager. Is it a little bit of a freer atmosphere between the, the, the manager and the front office than it had been previously? If that was the case, then Stephen Vogt uh, wouldn't have started out in AAA and Derek Barton wouldn't have been on the roster at the beginning of the year. So I don't, I don't, I don't think so. I think Billy Bean still – Pulls the uh, the levers as far as who is on the roster and the players that he has, um, but I, I do know that he respects Bob and I know he appreciates the job that he does and he recognizes, you know, maybe more so than before that the manager and his role and how he does his job is vital to the success of the team. But I don't know that it's changed Billy Bean as far as how he manipulates the roster and who he puts on it believe that there's probably there's, there's a little more re- respect as far as how Bob, how Bob utilizes the guys that he has. I don't, you know, from the movie, I don't know that, that, that Billy is ever going into Bob's office and saying, you know, is trading players in order to force Bob to play a particular guy. I don't think, I think their relationship is good enough that that doesn't happen. But as far as who Bob is working with and the decisions of who stays up or who goes down, Billy Bean is still firmly in control of that. 
Absolutely, and that, that's probably how it always will be. And, uh, again, that uh, you, you can never, I guess, completely mellow from being the kind of guy that was portrayed in that movie and in Michael Lewis's fine book prior to that. But, uh, again, as was the case uh, previously, uh, Rick, uh, an outstanding conversation with you. Thank you so much for making the time for us here today in the lounge. Really appreciate it, and uh, it will be a pleasure to have you back here at some point and catch up on things down the road. Thank you again for your time, sir. You got it. My pleasure. Appreciate it, and thank you all, everybody, for tuning in today to the FDH Lounge. As we bring the show to a close, we would like to extend our deepest gratitude to NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox, All Clear Channel Affiliates, TNT, TBS, USA, UPN, Deadspin.com, YouTube.com, YTMND.com, MySpace.com, various blogs, Fox News, CNN, CNBC, MSNBC, IAmBoard.com, Billboard.com, Google.com, ESPN, ESPN2, ESPN News, ESPN Classic, NBA TV, NFL Network, Sports Time Ohio. Athlon Magazine, Comedy Central, Cartoon Network, The Boomerang Channel, QVC, BET, The Spice Channel, Steno Notebooks, Manwich, Papermate Office Supplies, Waitresses, Strippers, Bartenders, Garbage Men, Janitors, Microwave Popcorn, The Writers of The Office, Scrubs, Entourage, My Name is Earl, Oz, Metalocalypse and the Boondocks, Aquafina, and The Periodic Table of Elements. 